I'm here with historian Joe Ellis. I'm Walter Isaacson of the Aspen Institute. We've been talking about the Constitution. And let me ask you, Professor, were they trying to create a democracy? And what did they feel about the word democracy? Certainly, when we talk about the American form of government, we call it a democracy. They didn't call it that. They called it a republic. And they were not Democrats in the full sense of the term that you will see in the 19th century with Andrew Jackson, the kind of world that Tocqueville will see. It's a pre-democratic world. What do I mean by that? That they want to create a form of government that is built on a popular democratic foundation. But they want the, the structure, the infrastructure of the government to be increasingly separated from popular opinion, from the swoonish swings in demagogic uh, moments. And so this thing called filtration, okay, we'll elect members of the House, but the Senate will be elected by state governments. And this is Madison's concept, which by filtration you mean that the will of the people is filtered through a few layers, so it, you know, it gets sort of moderated. Yeah, times. even Jefferson said the initial secretion of the people at large is always corrupt. Now, by the way, we're talking about they, but there are a whole lot of different people there. Mm. And certainly, I've written about Ben Franklin. He quite loved the notion of a popular democracy. He believed that we, the people, uh, he wanted good. a single house legislature, right? And he wanted to be directly elected by the people. And uh, he on wanted the, the government no officials to have no salary, too. Right. He thought somehow he was. He realized he was wrong about that because he. Mm -hmm thought that that would make it more sort of volunteer work, mm -hmm. but then he realized it would only be the elite who would get to serve, mm -hmm. so he changed it. But uh, there are other people at the convention who are on the other extreme from Benjamin Franklin and are really resistant to the notion of democracy, mm -hmm. right? They, mm -hmm. they worry about the unfiltered will of the people. Hamilton is probably the extreme example. He gave one six-hour speech in early June of 1787. Um, that, that will be like a tin can tied to his tail for the rest of his life <laughs> because in it he comes out in favor of a elected monarchy for life. Mm -hmm. Senators serve for life. Right. And he speaks of the British Empire as the role model for mm -hmm. what we are trying to do. Even one of his biographers, I think, calls it that speech, what's the word he used? Daft, right? He said, uh, brilliant, yeah, who, who was it? Uh, Ron Chernow. <laughs> said, said, brilliant, courageous, and completely daft. <laughs> Well, you know, so let's all remember that this wasn't just one group of founders, but there uh. was some competition, and there was some disagreement among the founders, even in the question of maybe we should have a president for life, almost like a monarchy, right? Yeah, I mean, the, we'll talk about the, mm. uh, the executive branch in another mm -hmm. uh, time, I think, but uh, the craziest thing they create, and m nobody in the rest of the world can understand it even now, is the Electoral College. But that's because they're kind of afraid of pure democracy, and they think that what turned out to be a wacky construct that we're still saddled with will help prevent a purely direct election of the president. Correct. There are some people that were in favor of, of a direct election of the president, but the opposition said things like, yeah, well, how will that happen? I mean, they, you know, they don't, they don't know. There's not political parties yet. There's not political conventions yet. There's no nominating process yet. And everybody just votes for whoever they want to. And that's, that's not going to work if it's if it's just a popular vote. In fact, I think most of the people at, at the convention thought that m most of the time the president would end up being elected by the House of Representatives because mm -hmm. nobody would get a majority. But, you know, they put a lot of what uh, we now call checks and balances. That was mm -hmm. in some ways supposed to temper the unfiltered will of the people, right? There's checks and balances in terms of uh, ways in which, let's say, the Senate has power, uh, shares power with the president in, in terms of treaty approval and approval of government appointments, yes. It's like a device that makes sure that it keeps balancing itself. And um, Sort of an enlightenment thing, meaning it is, Newtonian it is. mechanics. It where, is. You know, there's I wonder if we could design it under Einsteinian principles. We no, do I think it sometimes <laughs> feels like it was done by quantum <laughs> theory, but it was actually then done by Newton's theories, which uh, Jefferson, Franklin, uh, certainly uh, uh, Madison, they right. all read the enlightenment writers. They did, and while I think the institutional checks and balances is well known and correctly described as such. There are kind of personality checks and balances here. You've got a Hamilton, and a Madison, and a Franklin, who are really different temperaments, let's say. Governor Morris, who's you know, a real rake, R-A-K-E, he, by the way, is peg-legged. The statue of Washington that sits in front of the Virginia Capitol, which is designed by Houdon, 
the torso is Governor Mars. Wow, really? Well, you know, I always think of uh, Washington as made of marble on yeah. a pedestal. And there's a wonderful scene at the convention. In some ways, it deals with democracy, because there is this revered Washington. And I think it's your friend Hamilton bets Governor Morris that he won't slap Washington oh, right. on the back mm -hmm. and say, how are you doing today, General, mm -hmm. because he's such an austere character. And you don't get inside Washington's space. And yeah. you're absolutely right. This is apocryphal. I know this, but it's too good a story not to talk about. <laughs> and it was actually Hamilton that went up. Or no, maybe it was Governor Morris. Mm. And he put his arm around Washington and said, how you doing, General? And Washington stare, stared at him and lifted his arm off of his shoulder. And uh, that was the last time anybody Well, I've tried seen it that. written about, which is then uh, Governor Morris says, not for the price of a thousand dinners <laughs> would I ever do that again. <laughs> so we are talking about people who are balancing the role of these extraordinary people like Washington, who some saw as a potential monarch, with a more casual people's-like democracy. Yes, and people who, I mean, for example, Hamilton thought economically, Madison thought politically. For Hamilton, an aggregation, aggregates are good, consolidation is good. That's what capitalism is. Were there economic motivations of these founders, as Charles uh, Beard writes about, or is that oversimplifying it? I think even Beard himself, if he were brought back, would say I overstated the case. Nevertheless, the sort of quasi-Marxist, class-driven analysis has always had a certain audience. These were not the wealthiest men in America, although one of them was. Um, and I would say their distinguishing characteristic was less their wealth than their education. That said, uh, they, in some cases, were going to be the beneficiaries. They owned public securities, they owned land, the value of which would go up if the federal government came into existence and flourished. That's true. Surprisingly, a lot of them ended up broke. Yes, uh, um, but also, if you look at Madison, Hamilton, all the people writing the Constitution, Governor Morris, they have a motivation that seems a little bit more elevated. Absolutely. They, they, they think that this is the only way for the full potential for the American Revolution to be realized. And that if you don't do it, this thing called the Art Articles is going to end up in anarchy. And predator European nations are going to come over and, and you know, France is going to try to get its empire back. Britain's already still got troops up there on the northwest frontier. So things are going to fall apart, dissolve. Anarchy was the word Washington used, unless we do this. But if we do this, we establish the foundation for an empire in North America that has got unbelievable natural resources. And a country that stays together for two centuries is a shining light of what a republic can be. We'll talk about that next.